So thank you so much for hanging out and having a long day. And I want everyone to just get up for a second. So get up out of your chairs. Get up. All right. Shake it out a little bit. OK. Now this is really, really important. I want all of you to give a big seal of approval for ocean education. OK. You guys feel fresh now? <laughs> I do. <laughs> so my name is Dr. Andrea Neal, um, and while I'm a scientist and a nerd and a geek, I work a lot with kids, and it's something most people don't know about me. So I often put on another hat and become a marine educator, which is a lot of fun. Recently, I was a member of the rapporteur group at the Fifth International Marine Debris Conference, working on the Honolulu Initiative for NOAA and UNEP. And I wanted to point out some of the key things that we saw about education that came out as key points of where we see there is a lack of. One is development of modern information strategies based on accurate science. We want to give kids the right tools to communicate what they understand. Encourage a youth environmental movement. As was said by our young environmental leader here, kids get it. And they are going to be our future leaders. Engage people to work as a community. So no more of this my place, your place. We got to work together. We don't have enough time to mess around and to have our own personal space about this. We need to work together. And then my, the last one, which became a, a pretty big topic, is reach a broader demographic with marine science education. This was specifically acting on at-risk youth and urban education, which were often missed in the equation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about how do we reach a broader understanding and how do we reach a broad demographic. So something most people don't know about me, I'm a martial artist. And martial arts to me is a philosophy and a way of life. And so when I was developing these questions in my head, I went to my martial art instructor, my master. And I asked him, martial arts for many, many years has been crossing societal and cultural boundaries. How have they been able to do this? And like miss many, many things, Master Jang looked at me and he said, oh, it's very easy. Which of course to me is like, oh, how can something be so easy? And his explanation was that in Eastern culture, they have a how culture. And in Western culture, they have a what culture. And what that means is that with a how culture, you have to develop the steps to get to a goal or an end point. And you are morally responsible for all those steps. But in a what culture, it doesn't matter how you get to the finish line, it's just that you get to the finish line. And so if we incorporate a how culture into our education practices, then we can teach kids to have moral responsibility leading up to choices, that everything that they do leads up to the whole. And so that's something that I thought about a lot. And I put together some groups that I personally work with. This is not all the best groups in the world. There's tons of great education groups but ones that I think embody developing that how culture in kids. So the first one, of course, is Ambassadors of the Environment with Jean-Michel Cousteau's Ocean Future Society. And shown here is Dr. Richard Murphy. And so he teaches how ecology creates environmental ambassadors. And one of the ways that we do that and cross societal and cultural boundaries is we take four principles of ecology and put them to any system. And it's really cool because you can teach coastal ecology in Africa or you can teach it in California and the same principles are always there. The first one is everything runs on energy. And I'm sure a lot of you need some food and some energy. Well, it's the same thing in any system. The other is that there's no waste in nature. Nothing is ever wasted. And we need to think about that in our own actions and how we react with the environment. Biodiversity is good. Well, it wouldn't be fun if we all looked the same be no one fun to look at. <laughs> so those are some of the things we, we talk about with kids. And then the end is everything is connected. And when kids experience these types of philosophies firsthand and they see it in coastal ecology and creek ecology, terrestrial and ocean ecology, they immediately get the connection that not only is everything in nature connected, but they are intrinsic, intrinsically connected to nature. And everything that they do impacts nature. And everything that happens in nature impacts them. Many of the kids that go through this program never see the ocean until then, never see the environment until then. 
And so they're doubly bound with this amazing awe of our universe as well as they have an impact. The next group I really like to talk about is Santa Barbara High School's Don's Net Cafe. And this is a really cool group of kids. It's an at-risk youth program. And what they do is environmental entrepreneurism. And these kids are just incredible. They do things that make money, but are really good for the environment. And they only work with products that are socially and environmentally responsible. They uh, sell uh, bracelets that are called Do Ubuntu bracelets that help raise money for orphanages in Africa and help them build sustainable school systems. They work with reusable bags that are made in Indonesia that are made from waste plastics. I mean, they are just absolutely creative. They're making Christmas ornaments out of old newspapers this year and selling them for $25 a piece. I mean, they make a ton of money for their class, but they're doing a lot of good for the environment. One of my favorite groups is down south of us in Ventura, and it's the American Tall Ship Institute. And not only do they do education on tall ships, which is really fun, but she, one of my friends takes gang members, and mind, she's this tiny little cute blonde girl, takes gang members and teaches them how to build boats. And what this develops is a trust culture, a trust language between her and the students. And they have to trust her, they have to trust each other, and they have to trust themselves to build a boat and then sail it. And many of these kids have never swam before. So imagine getting in a boat that you've built. And it all develops that trust, and in turn, they get experiences in the environment, and they become environmental ambassadors. And there's just some quick pictures of the kids out on the boats. It's really pretty shit. One of the ones I really like in our local area is done by Art From Scrap. And what they're doing is they take kids and how teaching, teaching creates knowledgeable environmental stewards. So what these kids are doing in the fourth grade is they're taking what they've learned from their teachers and from environmental leaders like myself that come into the classroom and they're teaching the community. So they make games. This year one group made a slip and slide game that was about marine debris. And they make videos and comic books and uh, advertisement posters. And it's just amazing what they come up with. And the way they communicate what they intrinsically understand allows them to understand it better and communicates in a way that their peers understand it and their parents understand it. Because remember, the best way to get to parents is through kids. And then, of course, after all of those enrichment experiences, there needs to be follow-up. You have these great experiences, but what do the kids do after these initial experiences? Well, one of my favorite happens to be Digital Oceans. And the reason I like it is because it allows children to explore this interface that's like Facebook, but they get to communicate with ocean leaders and get information and pictures and video and explore their ocean community. So it's that after education process that's important. And then last but not least, of course, is some of the work that we do. So how science creates accurate edutainment. So this is from our trip in 2011 with the Schmidt Ocean Institute, and it was a lot of fun. And we brought a videographer on board, and my colleagues and I, who are top scientists from around the world, we became guinea pigs. So we had Craig Venture Institute on board with us, NASA, and Bari, Woods Hole, um, Pacamara, Penn State University, McGill University, and we became the scientists in the fishbowl. At one point during this expedition, I talked to 220 students at a school through Skype. <laughs> it was really fun. So I'm going to play a short video that is from there. Um, do you want to just... Wednesday, January 12th, 200 miles out from the Canary Islands Atlantic Ocean. Day two of 19 days at sea abroad the Lone Ranger, Blue Ocean Sciences jumps aboard Schmidt Ocean Institute's 255-foot scientific research vessel. We are in pursuit of solutions to ocean trash. We are hunting microbes that potentially eat plastic and may well yield new energy sources. Uh, I, I figured out that I'm the oldest person here on this cruise. And I've been in the business for a long time. And I can tell you, this is one of the most exciting areas in and, and missions of research that I have ever encountered. Toothbrushes, flip-flops, plastic beer glasses, and everything else has been thrown into the ocean. And of course, like all plastics, they're there forever. 
So we want to understand it so we know what are we really dealing with. These are human-made compounds. You can't find them in nature, which means we made compounds which impacting our environment. This is not a local or regional problem now, it's a global problem. The UV light, the sunlight, causes chemical reactions on the surface of the plastic. Some of the things they release are not good. And there are certain organisms out there that attach to the surface, and we hope, start eating it. Because if they start eating it, then we can use them to eat plastic in landfills or other dumps. Can you get plastic degraders that then produce electricity as a byproduct? I mean, then you kill kind of two birds with one stone. So these are all the reasons that everyone here wants to study what those processes are. Okay, so first things first, <clears throat> I'm standing between you and dinner. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to make this real short. <laughs> Listen up. So I'm sure as many of you, one of my inspirations when I was a kid was Jacques Cousteau. And it was the excitement and the adventure and finding out and discovery. And I think that's what we need to excite in children is why and how and how does this really work and you know, explore what you're, you're looking at. Because it's just, it's one of those amazing things to explore something and then to understand it. It's a beautiful gift. So to get dry again, <laughs> we need to get youth involved in ocean exploration. And unfortunately, in the economic times, one of the biggest hits have been our outdoor education programs. We see that in school systems, there's a lack of money going into uh, after school programs, into any of those extra extracurricular programs. And we need to find a way as a community to support that, whether it's with our time, whether it's with fundraising, we need to get in those classrooms and work with those kids. We need to get them out there. And that's something as a community we need to do. Use modern PR techniques to disseminate accurate information. Gosh, we are competing against the world's best movie makers and we gotta be the world's best movie makers too. And I think that's something we need to put money to and we need to in, in, you know, put money towards the arts and visual interpretations because a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, develop a universal database, um, scientifically validated information. If we want to make an impact, we need to back it with a good baseline analysis. Uh, seek new partnerships. No more of this, my space, your space, it's our space, it's everybody's space. And we need to work together to make it everybody's space. We need to bridge those gaps and work together. Mm, that's about it, so, yep. so thank you guys. That was great. Thank you so much. Well, our next speaker, next panelist, is somebody you should know well by now because he won an award the other night. Rudy Sanchez, the 2011 Youth Activism Peter Benchley Ocean Award recipient, co-founded and now leads the Rise Above Plastics program at his Los Angeles high school. Through this program, students have reduced their school's use of plastic and created and delivered presentations to their community about the impact of disposable and single-use plastics, both on public health and the marine environment. And he's working with Surfrider Foundation, Algalita Foundation, and others, and through these collaborations, They've organized and trained dozens of his peers to deliver action-oriented presentations that have reached over 8,000 additional people to date. And he recently expanded the program, training other students to create similar programs in other schools. So please welcome Rudy Sanchez. So, oh, hello everyone. Um, as he just mentioned, Rise Above Plastics, which is my group, and he just mentioned all my partners. So I guess this is 
that was just my title slide. <laughs> so what is Rise of Plastics? As he mentioned before, it's actually a national campaign. Um, but there was, there's one thing about it. It was full of all adults. There is no youth involvement. So what me and my friend had decided to do was let's reach out and partner up with other organizations so that we can have this program at our own school. So this is three years ago. We went through everything from making a presentation accessible to students, setting up meeting dates, gathering people, which is not as easy as it may seem. Not only that, but keeping the people interested in the program, doing reach out to other schools, which was a challenge in itself. Can you imagine? A teacher at a high school getting an email from a 16, 17 year old saying that they want to go into their classroom, take up class time, so they can give a presentation. If you're a teacher, what would your response be? <laughs> what would your response be? It would not be, yes, let's do it, let's do it right away. It would be, um, is this spam, first of all? Um, or I'm a, this, is need, this needs to be my junk mail. But of course, we got through all of that. And here, here I am, three years later, and the program is still going strong. You guys have all seen these, right? These, these are the solutions to the plastic, to the plastic debris we, we face. Obviously, bringing your own, um, having um, your own, instead of using a plastic bag, you bring your own reusable canvas bag. And of course, my favorite one is the glass jar. There's actually a cool story behind that glass jar. I went to a concert about a year ago. And of course, concerts seem to raise the price on every single piece of food and water that they sell. So I thought, I'm not, I do not want to spend $5 on a plastic water bottle. So I brought my own jar. And I filled it up right then and there. And I actually ended up saving money and not using plastics, which is the coolest part. So again, what makes RAP so special? It's youth run. As, as I mentioned before, there is basically no teacher involvement. We have a mentor who, is obviously, who obviously guides us in the process. And of course, if there's any trouble with any presentations or any teachers from other schools, she's there to help us. But mostly, it's all student run. So this is me and my friend, and we were the teens driving change. But let me rewind back again three years ago, actually four years ago, back when I did not care about the environment. And the reason, and it's funny, I went to, envir to an environmental school, environmental charter high school, but I did not go for the environment at all. I did not believe in the envir environmental movement. I actually had a, I did not really believe anything environmentalists had told me, just because it all seemed, all right, it's your fault, you're causing the trash, you're the reason the earth's hot, and I I'm asking you to buy this fancy car for a thousand more dollars. So that's what I thought environmentalists told me. So what changed from all of this? I got educated on different solutions. I saw that the solutions to our earth problems was not in buying new products. It came from me, from a personal statement that I decided to do. And, with, and mine was, I will refuse to use reusable, um, disposable plastics. I will refuse to go out and buy a as Kyle stated, a burrito and put it in a plastic bag, which I can easily just take out. I will bring my own water bottle. And it's just these small, simple solutions that I educated myself on, and I was doing it in my life. Of course, I did not think that was enough. If I was to create real change in my community, my local community, I should get others engaged as well. Again, that's where rap came from. But not just that, I had to get my parents involved and my family involved. And my family has been a great journey on training them how to rise above plastics just because they've known me from my life. And I'm one of those people that hates doing dishes. So the styrofoam plate was my best friend a couple of years ago. And the reason anything disposable, if it meant not doing dishes and spending that extra time at the sink, I would get that, I would get that plate, I would get that um, spork or whatever it was. And I, once I saw that this was, the, all my laziness was creating this world of debris my laziness was um, influencing this huge plastic consumption, it had to change. I knew it had to change. So me and Inspiration created all of these. These are all past students who have went through the Rise of a Plastics program. As you can see, at the bottom um, left corner, that's actually me in the, in, the plastic, in the plastic monster suit. 
We were presenting to an auditorium of 150 elementary school students. One of the biggest challenges is how do we, how do we modify the presentation without changing its message to different audiences? I'm not gonna stand up front 150 elementary school students and give them a bunch of facts on gyres, on toxins, on different statistics about plastic consumption. If I did, I would, I would have bored them to death and they would have been running around the whole auditorium. So what we did was, I dressed up as a monster. And I played along with them, giving different facts, and everything was presented that way. As you can see, we also engaged at the bottom left corner, at the bottom left corner again, that's us presenting at Google. So we had a room of developers, all, de um, they took a break, it was their lunch time, all from YouTube, um, they were working on Gmail, um, different Google services, they actually took their time off during their lunch break to come and speak with us. And it was funny, we were, educating, we were educating them. One of the smartest people on earth who developed YouTube and Gmail, and they were listening to us. And they were like, oh, we do that here. Or I didn't know that plastic came from this. I didn't know that albatrosses were found with a half a pound of plastic in their stomach, and that actually caused their death. So it's really cool. Youth can teach developers and these really smart people something. As you can see in that big picture, Rise of a Plastics has also inspired another group. Um, we, had, we had this group at our school called Recycled Fashion. But they took it a step further. They actually used a bunch of plastic material to create all their fashion. So you have girls with those big plastic bags and they make them into dresses. You have shirts with, with Capri Sun uh, patches all over them to, to create some type of design. Again. Public presentation is not the only way to spread a message. Me standing up here is not the only way to inspire people. You can do it through fashion. And to me, one of the best ways to inspire people is through everyday conversation. What if someone, if you're at Target, let's say you take your reusable bag, right? And, you, and you, you tell them, oh, no bag, please. And they refuse to listen to you. You say, oh, no bag, please. We should always do it with a smile, but of course, it's always gonna be those instances where people just don't listen. And that's a great way to engage in conversation. Engaging in conversation, you don't always have to be at a podium to inspire people. Just that one conversation telling them all these statistics that you know, plastic consumption, and how it's taking up over our world, you can obviously um, already um, set change at Target. At Target, you guys. And again, this is us presenting at uh, more different high schools. Again, the, the, the ration, recycled fashion girls, showing off their designs. So we're used to seeing, uh, before, when I first started off giving presentations, the, a huge part of the PowerPoint presentation was just statistics and facts. And when I went to present there, I felt like I was just reading it off. And I'm not saying we shouldn't use science or statistic or math to prove a point. Those are really important. But if we don't relate it to the audience and we're just giving them 57%, six out of 10, one out of every five people, they're not gonna listen because you're not relating it to them. You have to make sure that the, the, the statistics match the people's lifestyle and they know, they can see for the first hand that those statistics are actually real life re representations of their lives. So how do you effectively convey a message without losing, without losing the message? Because many times I feel that when you say, let's effectively convey it, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, let's sell out and let's put a bunch of celebrities and fake statistics up there to prove our point. That's not what conveying a message is. Conveying a message is making sure that every single person is relating to, this, to what I'm trying to say. And when you guys hear, oh, it's story time, I bet you guys start thinking of elementary school, right? When your kindergarten or your preschool teacher would just gather you up in a circle and say, oh, I'm gonna tell you a story about Goldilocks or um, Little Red Riding Hood. Story time is effective in any type of age group. We all wanna hear stories, we love stories. So why don't we turn a presentation to inspire people? A storytelling is way more effective than me just listing off a bunch of facts. So we wanna give solutions. We do not just wanna say, oh, you're gonna die if you eat this, you're gonna die if you drink from this plastic water bottle. That plastic bag you have is actually killing albatrosses. You do not wanna tell them all the doom and gloom. You wanna say, this is the problem we have right now. But you know what? You have the power to change it. You have the solutions in your mind and I'm giving you, I'm giving you these solutions so you can spread out to everyone else you know. 
Another, another thing you do not want to do is you do not want to blame people. No one likes being blamed. No one. So if you tell them, oh, it's your fault that we have this, or it's your fault that we have that uh, people, are, people are getting toxins in their system, then you're like, it's not my fault. And they just shut down. We have to make sure that we're working with people and not against them. I'm going to show you a couple of images. And these are what we use in our presentation. Obviously, this is going to be striking to a lot of people because no one sees a turtle in that shape. And I could just show you this image and say, oh, this is what plastic does. Or I could tell you a story. This turtle's name is actually Mae West. At a very young age, she got trapped in this smoke ring. When scientists found her, her body had acclimated into that shape. Even though they already took the milk ring off, her body's still that way. It, made up, might, it might have gone a couple of centimeters, but it's still in that shape. Why? Because that's how, she, because that's how